Hello and welcome to the I Am Woman Project, where every week we have deep thought-provoking and interesting conversations with thought leaders, change instigators, rule breakers and creative minds who think differently, sparking creativity and inspiration. Our special guests on our show cover a variety of topics just for you and they share their personal stories to inspire, motivate and empower you, our listener. The I Am Woman podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at www.catherineplano.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. Today we have the trustworthy Dr. Linda Wilson. Linda is a corporate health and wellness consultant, stress management specialist, business owner, radio host and mum. She manages to keep herself out of trouble most of the time, but has been known to raise an eyebrow by insisting that understanding your mind can change your world. Dr. Linda Wilson is also the author of Stress Made Easy, Peeling Women Off the Ceiling. She consults and owns a multi-modality wellness practice and has an online program designed to assist women to reclaim themselves when life happens. On Tuesdays, you can hear Linda on her radio show, which focuses on stress, health and well-being for individuals and within business. Linda understands that the capacity to change your mind changes your world. Linda has helped hundreds of clients better identify, understand, and manage their stress, addictions, and behaviors. So sit back, tune in, and relax. So welcome to the show, Linda Wilson. How are you today? Oh, thank you, Catherine. I am really well, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to chat with you and your audience. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Pleasure. So we were having a bit of a conversation before uh, we started the recording. We we're talking a little bit about what you do. Uh, what, what, what about uh, if you maybe uh, do a little bit of an introduction of what you do? And I think more more than anything, I'd really like for us to deep dive into the corporate health and wellness side of things. Sure, okay. So um, some of your listeners may know that the the concept of, you know, em- emotional health and well-being within organisations has become a huge focus. The statistics for anxiety, depression, stress leave are phenomenal within Australia. And, and I think the last figures that I looked at, um, it's somewhere around between the 12 to $15 billion a year that it actually costs us as a society um, from a financial perspective Uh, Because people are incredibly stressed at work or they're going through experiences directly related to their work that means uh, their emotional health is is severely impacted. So the financial side of things is one thing, but then what is it actually doing not only to those individuals but their families as well? And I think corporate Australia is really starting to um, pay attention to the fact that if they're able to provide environments for their employees with a wellness focus, with a focus that um, suggests to them that there's a lot more they can do, that there's responsibilities that they can take. What this does is it means you have growing people and growing people grow businesses and, and that's what I'm really passionate about. So when we're looking at it, is it predominantly more women or men when we're talking about anxiety, depression, that kind of thing? I think that the the, the real uh, figures for that are actually unknown. I, I think that there's a massive amount of underreporting of things like uh, stress, depression, anxiety. Um, I mean, the figures that have come out that 
that uh, financial figure that I mentioned suggests that it's $15 billion, but that doesn't actually give you much of a breakdown as to what the proportions are. I think in some ways women are more uh, able and, and perhaps willing to talk about their stress, their anxiety, uh, whereas I think it's still a, a much more of a hidden problem, an unspoken problem within um, the male community. Yeah, I remember last year because I read an article on it and we did a little bit of research. There was, because it was rising, there was one in every three women mm -hmm. uh, with anxiety, depression, and stress that was just the, inc it was up on the increase. So that was like over a year ago. So I don't, I don't know what it would be like now. That's why I was asking. Yes. And mm -hmm. it was predominantly back then. Uh, it might have even been 18 months ago, it was predominantly women uh, rather than men. And it could be as simple as you're saying that women tend to be more open about it whereas men might not talk about it. Well, I think with so many uh, things that are associated with revealing that emotionally you're struggling, um, lots of people make the decision that, it, you know, it puts them in a very vulnerable um, place. And often when you're already experiencing that kind of overwhelm, you're not necessarily wanting to put your hand up and say, hey, I'm not coping. Um, you know, back in the day, and I'm, I'm really pleased that, you know, there is this change within corporate environment. Um, it was shameful to admit that you were struggling for whatever reason. Um, and I think what we're beginning to learn now, and certainly there's a lot of education around Beyond Blue do an incredible job of that, etc. really educating people that there is a significant number of us that will struggle with our mental and emotional health at one or more times in our life. Yeah, it's true. And it, it is one of those things that does. I think it's also just the pressure too. When you're talking, I mean, I've, I've worked in corporation for 22 years and I myself mm. many moons ago um, suffered anxiety. And it was one of those things that I kept to myself because I didn't want anyone, you know, I, I looked at that as a sign of weakness. Yes. That was the one thing. And for me, it took me a long time to actually come out and talk about it. And it only came out when I was able to control it uh, because it was it was out of control. And yeah. it was pretty scary for a woman who was climbing the corporate ladder who's always been in control to all of a sudden have no control. Um, it was pretty frightening. Mm. And I think this is the thing, Catherine, like uh, I really feel – that what people um, are missing in terms of their education, and this is certainly something that I teach um, my corporate clients, is that there are, you know, red flags along the way. The problem is that we don't know what we're looking for. And so there's a real... Um, I guess a, a black hole of information about what you should be looking for in terms of your coping skills, your coping mechanisms, how you're managing the stress that you are aware of because your body is going to give you an enormous amount of information and your uh, emotional um, interactions with people. But if we're not really looking for it or know how to look for it or what to look for, it can creep up on us. As you say, um, you know, you're a powerful woman, uh, very capable at the job that you were doing, and yet somehow it managed to creep in. And I think what is most useful to people is actually learning some skills um, to recognize what are the red flags. Yeah, and I think that that's one of those things that I absolutely probably didn't give myself the space or the permission to take mm -hmm. that time out and actually acknowledge what was going on. It was just a fast pace. I was a single mum too. So it's just, yes. you know, there was so many other factors that sort of led to it. And it was just like, you just, you know, suck it up. That's what I, I remember saying to myself, just suck it up and just get on with it. And mm. so it, it was it was debilitating. And I, I was, you know, in denial that I was actually going through it. Uh, and then it just, you know, it was one of those things that, I was overseas in New York and, 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 and I thought I was having a heart attack. I collapsed mm -hmm. it up in hospital and it wasn't until they told me I was having, I had a panic attack. Panic attack, yeah. I, yeah. I never uh, heard of. Exactly. And, and I think too that, um, you know, we have this incredible capacity to carry stress and uh, deal with it over extended periods of time. What we don't actually realise though is that there is a toll and that toll is being taken on our bodies. So our body will carry this stress, the anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. It will deal with the impact on our nervous system uh, for a period of time. Ultimately, though, that kind of 
rolls into one. And if we don't have significant periods of being able to de-stress and unload um, the, the stress and anxiety that our body has been carrying, that's when we have an experience exactly like yours. And uh, as you say, you thought you were having a heart attack and what it was was actually a panic attack. And, and this is a really common story, more common than I think um, many people would believe. Oh, I agree. It's only now that I've spoken out about it that I hear more of it now, but it's, it's, it's what it was to be. I would not speak about it. It was one of mm -hmm. those things that my family knew about it, but that was it. I wouldn't dare uh, speak about it. And not only that, I think it's more so that I was a, afraid that people would look at me as, um, uh, you know, how could you be doing, you know, being an executive coach and doing all these things, uh, when you've gone through that. And it was, it, and the point was, it's because I had gone through that, that I was able to do the things that I was doing because I'd actually wow. put up, but it's not one of those stories that I shared. Yeah, I, I think um, what you've just said is so key. I think that rather than uh, us as a society or generally our community viewing these experiences that individuals have as weakness, there is an incredible um, body of knowledge that we could actually be utilising. And the more people that actually tell their story and normalise this process and add to the, you know, the big bucket of education about um, how these things can occur, her. The more people that actually do that, um, I think that's a magnificent thing that we can do for, for everybody around us. The other thing is too, I think that um, people want to hold up this persona for so many different reasons and uh, we, we can really examine what, which of those reasons are uh, will stand the test of time. Let me put it that way. I think, um, you know, are, are we doing it out of our own sense of ego? Are we doing it out of fear? Are we doing it out of, you know, there's so many reasons. And I think examining those really closely will actually free many people up to tell the truth about this, this sort of situation. So, so, Linda, if you don't mind me asking, what made you get into uh, the corporate environment with the focus of health and wellness? What, what was so, the driver for you? Well, I was, I'm a corporate escapee and I got out of corporate because I found that the environment that I was in, and so we're talking 20 odd years ago now, I found that the environment that I was in was not a match for my values. So what I mean by that is that um, what was driving the business model was a very metrics based type thing and i'm a i'm a person who loves relationships so what drove my values is very much about connection communication authenticity and uh building teams and it, I just could not find that in the corporate environment that I was in. And then one of those amazing and beautiful things happened in my life and that is I came across traditional Chinese medicine and all of a sudden I, had, I found my home because they have a philosophy about that mind-body connection, our interconnectedness both within ourselves but with other people and ultimately um, the universe if you really want to get out there. Um, and it really resonated with me that there is that a decision that I make in my life has an impact in places that I could never ever imagine and if we extrapolate that out now to our society where technology where exactly what you and I are doing together tonight this is you know could could go global there will be people that will hear this that 20 years ago would never ever have had, had access to information so um, I needed to move out of that I found this amazing um, form of healthcare and that began my journey. And of course, I've returned to corporate because I have that experience and I realise that I can reach groups of people rather than doing the one-on-one -on -one work, which has been a huge part of um, what I've done over the last 20 years. I did, uh, when I was going through that phase, I had one really bad year of anxiety where I couldn't leave the house. I was, you know, there was mornings I couldn't even walk. I was crawling the floor and um, mm. I remembered I went to see so many different doctors and, you know, just to understand what was going on. And yes. they wanted to put me on this medication, which I refused. And what I did do is go to a Chinese doctor, which I'd been going for, you know, over 10 years. And I was going there every week. So I was getting acupuncture, um, doing the cupping, such a 
release the stress out of my body. I was getting these herbs that that looked like he just went to his backyard, <laughs> yep. put them all in a brown paper bag and said, here you go, ball these up and drink them. And they were disgusting. Yes. But I tell you what, it, they really worked. It really helped me. And I find that you know, it really saved me because, you, you know, they talk about your meridians and they talk about, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of anger in your liver and, you know, it, it's, it's just something that it's, it's been around for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years um, that we don't tap into, but it is so powerful. Exactly. And, and I think that, you know, anything that has survived uh, 5,000 years of use and scrutiny has got something that it can offer. If, if you compare, say, Chinese medicine to um, modern Western medicine, um, you've got, you know, you've got about 4,500 years worth of, um, you know, practice difference there. And uh, I think um, what ha is fabulous is that it's now a registered profession uh, within Australia and um, there are many very, very highly talented practitioners out there and what they are interested in is looking at you as a whole person and I think sometimes this is what can be missed. We are, you know, we are complex um, organisms that have incredible interactions with our environment and we need to understand all of the ways that we can be influenced so that we can come up with ways to um, keep ourselves well and healthy no matter what it is that we are choosing to do with our lives. And you touched on something really important. There. You look at the whole person rather mm -hmm. than, you know, and we were talking about this the other day with, with, with my husband. It's like you could look at, you know, they the doctors, what they do in medicine today, they'll fix up one thing mm -hmm. uh, and, for example, it will, you know, ruin something else. So, for example, you know, they might put you on uh, a medication of some sort but then will have an impact on your liver or your heart, you know. And, and Bruce Lipton does this. He talks about how... Uh, you know, it, medicine's killing us because the doctors mm -hmm. are giving us all this medication, fixing up one thing, but in actual fact, it's ruining another thing, which can be a killer for us. Yeah, I've always said to my clients that there is a place for everything. And Western medicine, if you're having a heart attack, if you've got a limb that's, you know, falling off, they are the experts in that area. But until we get to um, that sort of more extreme end of um, care, there is so much more that we can take responsibility for. And I'm really big on that one. I think that we, you know... Um, I certainly grew up thinking that um, my health, in, to a certain extent, was somebody else's problem. I would just go to the doctor and they would fix it. And clearly through my own education and my own learning, I now am on the complete opposite end of that spectrum. And I am always talking to my clients about this is your body, you've only got one of them. Let's look at how we can reduce your stress and other negative emotions so that your body, your nervous system and your mind are operating at its maximum capacity because uh, otherwise, why bother? True. And what would be some of those things? So for those that are listening and, and going through that, currently they're going through that, what would be some of those uh, advices that you would do for them to help de-stress? So um, one of the things that I am I am very, very passionate about is education. So I spend a lot of my time educating people about the fact that when we understand how our brain works, we can actually use that information to manipulate it. And I know manipulate sounds like a perhaps a negative um, word, but when I'm talking about manipulation, I'm talking about us actually stepping back into the driver's seat. I have a lot of clients who come to me, they're very, very angry at their body. They feel like their body is letting them down because they either have some form of chronic illness or they, uh, you know, they have a something going on with them. It could be pain, for example, that they simply do not understand. And when I show them that, that what's happening in their body is all also happening in their uh, mind and that there is a connection between those two things and that when you understand the connection you can powerfully impact the way that the body is sending you signals 
that is uh, a revelation to many, many people. And, you know, that is the philosophy of traditional Chinese medicine. I am no longer practicing as an acupuncturist, but I use that philosophy every day when I educate people about stress, stress management, and uh, how they can take care of themselves in that wellness spectrum. So are you saying, just so that I understand, Linda, so you're saying that, for example, it's to, because obviously you're talking about mind and body connection, so it's about uh, able to steal the mind and to maybe change the way that we think mm-hmm. uh, and therefore change uh, our health. Um, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Because what we focus on, we create more of. So, um, what I mean by that is that we have uh, these neural pathways in our mind, and the more time we spend focused on a particular thing, the stronger that neural pathway becomes. So, if you think about it as a a road work, you know, uh, the things that we spend an enormous amount of time thinking about, focusing on, um, ruminating over and practicing we actually create six lane highways for those particular thoughts the the opposite thing also happens the things that we don't spend any time focusing on practicing ruminating over those pathways actually become smaller and smaller and smaller and as human beings we actually have a negativity bias and what i mean by that is the survival of our species has depended on us identifying and ranking threats to our survival. So, of course, we are predisposed to spend time thinking about the negative because prehistorically that's what kept us alive. Now, even though we have progressed as a species over thousands and thousands of years and we're now very sophisticated, our primitive brain still kind of runs the show from that perspective. So what I can teach my clients is that if you are going to have emotions... Why not spend your time practicing the good ones? If you're going to have memories, why not spend your time within the good memories? So that what you're actually doing is building up that are attached to um, our traumatic memories, our um, our poor health, our physical condition, and and perhaps our emotional instability as well. So there are so many ways that we can actually use our mind to understand our brain, and when we have that understanding, incredible things can happen. Mm, I'm a true believer that I always say that you know it really depends on how we think to how we behave to the results that we. Uh, get from that so and I really believe that you know I'm always saying to myself I I hear myself saying I've got such a strong mind and I'll I'll just keep I'll just you know this is how I roll and I'll keep pushing through and this is how I got to the whole anxiety piece because it's one of those things that I really truly believed that I had a strong mind and that was how I rolled and you know and I created it for myself really Uh, whereas Mm -hmm. now I you know I spend I get up at five o'clock every morning I meditate, I set my intentions. Uh, I still work really hard. I, I'm not going to deny that. There's, it's so busy. But, mm. you know, the trick is is about creating that balance. And I think that, you know, especially when you love what you do, it feels like you never work a day in your life. And that could be a mm-hmm. trap in itself. You can yes. end up working 16 hours and then your body's, you know, exhausted. That's it. And, you know, we, we talk about this work-life balance, but um, really it's all, it's all life. All of it is life. And I think as um, business owners, I mean, I'm a, a small business owner, um, because we're passionate about what we do, we love what we do, we can become too absorbed in that and we forget that life is, you know, made up of a whole array of different things. And uh, that I think sometimes small business owners are their own, own worst enemies, that's for sure, in terms of um, really maintaining that balance. And I think for me to, to you know, work-life balance is so cliche. Does it really exist? And I think for me mm. it was trying to separate life and work to create the balance and that just didn't work for me. So it was a matter, a matter of, you know, embracing and incorporating my work and my life together and and it was there was so much more flexibility and it just it was 
it moved better for me. There was no resistance or conflict. So I think for me, that was the trick for me was just not to try to separate it too much, but plan. So for example, you know, I plan for, you know, I have a date night with my husband. So that's our Friday night. And then Saturday is our family or we'll go, you know, catch up with the family. But, you know, you have to plan these things, but you have Mm -hmm. to also be flexible that, It's not, you know, it's not black and white. There are gray areas in life and it's about, it is, it's just a life. Yeah. We have to schedule in dream time, escape time and downtime as seriously as we schedule in the dentist, uh, you know, meeting up with our clients or doing those day-to-day tasks that keep our business running. And I do feel that there is a a bit of a a change in people's minds around this stuff, and I think that's a really wonderful thing. You know, we really are starting to examine um, how we can find that balance in our um, day-to-day lives, and it's really important. As you see the emergence of female entrepreneurs, um, You, uh, I think there's going to be a really big change in the way that business are run and the way that that culture is developed and I really believe that women will lead the way with that oh look it's something that I'm really passionate about and I write about and it it is it's very much one of those things I talk about stop labeling because I always Mm -hmm. you know it's there's not much that's changed in the corporation for the last 50 years really there's not been enough we we talk about it all the time we talk about diversity equality and you know I think that a lot of corporations uh, don't know how to actually go about it. I think it's just, just got to stop talking about it because I think yep. you're, we keep reinforcing it. We keep focusing on it. It's just that whole, you know, we keep thinking about it. So therefore, we'll keep behaving that we're the lesser and we're the, you know, whatever that may be, and mm-hmm. we'll keep getting those results. So I think we've just got to change those conversations. Yep, and, change and, the model. Change yeah. the model. Absolutely. Change the system. And to do that, you know, it could be the we have to reverse engineer. It could be the system that created it in the first place. You know, those yeah. kind of conversations. So we've got to, you know, educate and sort of turn it around, turn it over on its head kind of thing. I agree. And I think that, uh, I mean, that's why I think so many women are choosing to go into business for themselves. You know, they've done what you and I've done. They've worked in corporate and recognised um, that perhaps it, it might financially be very beneficial but what is missing is an expression of themselves too often. And uh, that's just not sustainable. I think that women are now looking for ways that they can actually be who they really are out there in their working, uh, the working part of their life. And uh, with the radio show that, that I do, um, I am so privileged to actually talk to many of those women. And gee, there's some magnificent stuff happening out there. And, you know, I, it's very inspiring for me to actually speak with these women who are doing exactly what you and I are doing, Catherine. And that is, you know, really breaking the mold of how it's been done in the past and bringing with them the essence of who they are into their business. So, Linda, with the benefits of hindsight, what would you have done differently in your life or career? Okay. Um, Wow. I would have stopped thinking that I was not good enough years and years before I did. So um, not good enough, didn't know enough, that I was just playing and tinkering at these things rather than taking them as seriously as I could and also just thinking small. So, um, you know, I think that if I, as the the 47-year-old woman that I am now, had the maturity uh and could put that back in my 20-year-old body, wow, things would really happen. So for me, it's very much about um, stopping that uh, that judgment of self and making myself smaller than I needed to be. Oh, I love that. Uh, And what's been the greatest lesson for you, Linda? The greatest lesson would definitely be that, well, I'd have to come back to that exact same thing, that, you know, 
you have one opportunity at this. There's a whole lot of, um, you know, uh, philosophy around you come, you know, the energy never dies, you come around again. There's the whole conversation around, uh, you know, multiple lives, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about specifically in this life where we are conscious now. We have a limited amount of time and I think we waste an incredible amount of time not trusting ourselves and not, not going with our gut feeling you know, second guessing, um, playing small, um, doing those kinds of things. And, and I think uh, we can do that for years and years. And it's, it's a tragedy. Yeah, no, it's true. And I, I, can, I can relate to what you're saying. So you sound pretty laid back, Linda. Is there anything that keeps you up at night? Or is there anything that worries you in mm. the evening when you're there lying in bed, just thinking? <laughs> well, I'm a stress management specialist, so I should probably, you know, for, the, for clients out there who might consider hiring me, say no, nothing. But that wouldn't actually be true. And it's not authentic for me to say that I don't worry about things. I do actually worry about things. And, and what it is, is uh, essentially, have I done the best thing I could as a mum? So I have the privilege of, of being a stay-at-home mum and I know many, many women cannot make that choice for themselves. Um, and I've, all, I've never wanted those two things, so my personal journey, my personal advancement, my career, to impact on that decision that I made to be a mum and be there for as much of my kid's life as I can. So occasionally... I do get into that trap, but I also find that what is really important is that you have to forgive yourself often. And uh, one of my mantras for myself and my clients is I'm doing the very best that I can with what I know right now. When I know more, I'll do differently. I love it. And I'm big on forgiveness. I think that it's one of those things that I do on a weekly basis. I wouldn't say every day. I try to, to remember to do it every day, but it doesn't, it depends on how tired I am. But I think yeah. it's just one of those <laughs> things, just not, but forgiving, not just so much forgiving others, but forgiving, forgiving yourself because sometimes you can sort of how, hold on to things that you may have said and like, was that the right thing? Or was yeah. that the right thing that I've done that? Or, you know, did I do good today as a mother or whatever that may be? So, you know, forgiveness plays uh, a big part in my life because it actually just sets me free yeah. from those, and, think those thoughts. Yeah, and I, I also think, um, you know, we're talking about that whole concept of playing small and thinking small and, you know, letting perfectionism get in the way. The other thing that I've really come to over the last few years is um, – I've, I've come to realize that for women in relationships, I would really like them to consider that if your partner was not there, would you have done things differently? Because often I think that having those securities in place can often mean that we back off and that that can be really detrimental in the long time, in the long term, not only for our emotional muscles, but also our financial well-being. You know, we all, we are all very aware of the, um, super contributions uh, information that's out there about women at the moment that uh, there is a real disparity um, between the savings that women have in super versus uh, men and so I, I really want to put a challenge out there to to women if you didn't have a partner in your life and you had to do this on your own would you make different decisions and if you would try doing that right now well, that's really interesting because I have to say that, you know, for me, I wouldn't be here without my husband. My husband is, I call him my spine and mm -hmm. he's my, he's got my back. And I think that I truly, with his support uh, and he's, he's an advocate of what I do and, you know, he does everything, uh, you know, like from when I'm really busy and I travel a lot, he does everything. Um, you know, just not to support me, support the company, but, you know, even around the house. I, I'm just mm. so blessed with it. And so, you know, to think about what would I be like or where would I be like without him, mm -hmm. wow, that's a really hard hard uh, question for me to answer because um, I don't I know where I'm, I'd be. Yeah, and I, I think I'm talking about that whole concept of, just being brave and taking risks, um, you know, maybe putting your hand up where uh, you might not have before, maybe um, putting yourself in a situation where you're challenged 
um, where you may not have before. And the only reason that this is, you know, sort of come to my attention is because uh, over the course of working on the show, um, a lot of women have come out of relationships. And so they're in a transition period in their life. And we've discussed well, what are you doing differently now? Of course, your whole financial situation may have changed, et cetera, et cetera. You may now be a single parent. And so many women say, I held myself back. I, I was not as brave. I, uh, I, I wasn't really expressing who I am. And that's why it's become part of my conversation that I'm having not only with myself but also with um, friends, family, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so when you say in that way, I have to say that the father of my son, when I was in a relationship with him, I can't say that I was brave like I am today. I yeah. can't. I, th I think that and I was a single mum for 11 years, so it took me probably, uh, you know, it gave me that time to really get to know myself and how to be brave. Uh, but, you know, it, it, once again, if I look back then, I, I, it took me to get out of that relationship to be where I am today and to yes. have that brave uh, the confidence um, and the willpower and I guess, you know, backing myself and it took me to get out of that relationship to be where I am today, yes. But mm. having this amazing husband now, uh, coming into this relationship with being brave and confident and being completely different and I think I probably didn't love myself then whereas I love myself now. So yeah. that's a big difference too. And you found yourself in that space, it sounds like. Absolutely. And yeah, and, and so what I'm, I really want to put that question out there. Um, you know, who are you? And are you being, uh, are you being that ultimate version of yourself? I guess is the question. Or, you know, somebody said, um, I can't remember. I wish I could, but it was this beautiful quote that we don't grow older. We become more of ourselves. And I wish I'd done that a bit faster, I have to say. No, I think we – and, you know, it's, it's we say this, isn't it? It's so cliche. We talk about it all the time. Like, if only I had this knowledge 20 years ago, boy, <laughs> I would be such a different woman today. Yeah. We all do it. But I think that's all part of life, isn't it? I think that it's, it's you know, I think that some of those experiences that we go through, I think you need to embrace them because – they are who we, you know, like I always look back at some of the things that I've gone through in my life when we all have stories, but mm -hmm. I, I would be the woman I am today without them. That's right. And, you know, that's part of that forgiveness process as well, I think, that um, it's all part of the journey. There is no wrong in that we do what we do until we decide we need to do better, until we get skills on board that enable us to do that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I am the person I am today because of the experiences I've had. That's exactly what you've expressed. And there can be nothing wrong with that. It was just part of our journey and that's the way we did it. Um, I think if I had had women and uh, men around me who were having these kinds of conversations, um, maybe I would have got there a little bit faster. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, and then that that ties, ties back to, I guess, technology. You know, yeah. we didn't have these kind of platforms where we could have these conversations that could, you know, um, like you said, it could it could go global where somebody, you know, lots of people could listen to this conversation. We didn't have these kind of, um, you know, for, you know, um, we didn't have the technology. We didn't have these, mm -hmm. you know, smartphones and everything that's available to us now, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Well, well I didn't. I don't remember ever, you know, I was, I was saying the other day, I wonder what, what my life was like, you know, 10 years ago without a mobile phone <laughs> or even 20 years ago. How did I live my life? Probably a with... bit more relaxed. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So, Linda, it's been an absolutely – I could talk to you forever. You're just an amazing woman. And, and what we do at, when we wrap up the show, we always uh, love to give our listeners three golden nuggets. Uh, so what three golden nuggets would you like to give our listeners? Oh, okay. Um, well, you asked the really big questions. Um, okay. First of all, understand your physical and emotional capacities. Then schedule in rest and recuperation as a non – negotiable mm. if you aren't physically and emotionally fit everything falls apart so that is a non-negotiable then the second thing would be don't be afraid to stretch your capabilities and make sure that you um, put the oxygen mask on yourself first 
You are not your business. It's just one expression of you. So don't be a slave, be a leader. That would be that would be the second one. And then understand how your mind works. Um, there is so much incredible information out there. Bruce Lipton is someone you mentioned. Um, uh, Dawson Church is another amazing uh, scientist that I love to read about uh, who talks about the brain and the way it works. There is so much information out there about how we can really harness the incredible power of our brain and our mind. Um, go out there and find some. Oh, I just love it, and I think that I'm going to take one of those one of those uh, golden nuggets up is to actually schedule time to rest. I actually don't do that, and mm. I, as you were saying, it's like wow that you know I I schedule my date night, I schedule my family night on Sundays. I do my writing; it's it's my writing time, mm-hmm. and but I don't actually schedule time out to actually rest. Yeah. It's, it's so vitally important. And I think as we get older as well, it's even more important that, that capacity to rejuvenate. And the, the, thing, the thing that's missed with it often is that when we do that, our creativity improves, our problem-solving skills improve, our communication with, with the people around us improves, and within ourselves it also improves. And just our general capacity to um, be more, create more of who we are improves when we are physically and emotionally rested it's amazing thank you so much so linda for our listeners where can they find you you can find me oh lots of different places you can look up my name linda wilson on facebook so it's facebook.com slash linda wilson you can look for me under dr stressless on twitter um, I am on LinkedIn and you can also go to my website www.drlindawilson.com and there, the book is available from the website if anybody's interested in having a look at that. And tell us a quick, uh, a little bit of a, a snapshot of what your book's about. The book is really about the the philosophy and the thinking that I don't get to talk about when I'm in session doing my one-on-ones. In those sessions, we're so busy uh, just applying the tools that I don't actually get to talk to people about how their brains are actually working. So the book is my, I guess, my leverage for being able to really educate people about what they can do and how they can make those changes for themselves. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Linda, for your time. And as I said, I could speak to you forever. I'm really enjoying the the conversation with you. And I'm sure our listeners will love uh, listening to this interview. So thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you, Catherine. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. That brings us to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed the show as it is my mission to reach out and inspire as many individuals like you. And one of the best ways to help us achieve this goal is by giving us a good review on iTunes. It's easy and it only takes about 10 seconds. If you have any questions or special guests that you would like to hear from, please send us an email to support at katherineplano.com.au and we will get right back to you. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook at Catherine Plano. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Until next week, please take care.